Welcome to the Codesultant channel. In our previous videos, we explored the definitions associated with grounding and bonding. Today, we will delve into the first rule of Article 250, which focuses on the general requirements for grounding and bonding as stated in Section 250.4a. Which is the grounded system? Without any delay, let's dive right into this interesting topic. Section 250.4 General requirements for grounding and bonding states that the following general requirements identify what grounding and bonding of electrical systems are required to accomplish. The prescriptive methods contained in this article shall be followed to comply with the performance requirements of this section. The code establishes general requirements for grounding and bonding in electrical systems. These requirements outline the necessary measures to achieve proper grounding and bonding. To meet the performance requirements outlined in this section, it is essential to adhere to the prescriptive methods specified in Article 250. By following the prescribed methods, one can ensure compliance with the performance requirements for grounding and bonding. Let's further clarify the concept of performance requirements. Performance requirements establish the desired objectives that grounding and bonding practices should achieve. They serve as the benchmark for the expected outcomes of these practices. For instance, one performance requirement states that all non-current carrying conductive materials within the electrical system must be connected in a manner that ensures continuity. How about the prescriptive methods? Prescriptive methods refer to the specific techniques or procedures outlined in Article 250 of the Code. These methods need to be followed in order to fulfill the performance goals. By adhering to the prescribed methods, we guarantee that grounding and bonding practices effectively meet the performance requirements. For example, a prescriptive method mandates that all metal enclosures should be bonded using an insulated copper conductor of at least 12 AWG, as specified in Table 250.122, for any application above 50 amperes. This section covers the grounding requirements for grounded systems under Section 250.4 A and ungrounded systems under Section 250.4 B. There are different grounding systems recognized by the code, these are solidly grounded, high impedance grounded system, and ungrounded system. Solidly grounded is defined by the code that is connected to the ground without inserting any resistor or impedance device. Here is the sample configuration of the solidly grounded system. Single phase, three wire, configurations are commonly used in residential and light commercial establishments. The circuit breaker panels typically have two live, hot wires and a neutral. Three phase, four wire, the most common commercial building electric service, has voltages 208 volts, 3 phase and 120 volts volts single phase, which is used to power, lighting, small appliance loads, and smaller AC systems. In larger facilities, with this configuration, the voltage can be 480 volts for 3 phase and 277 volts for single phase. Single phase is used to power, and lighting, while 480 volts are used for larger equipment. 4-wire delta, also known as high-leg delta, is a type of electrical distribution system commonly used in commercial and industrial settings. It is a three-phase system that uses a combination of a center tap transformer and three-phase transformers to provide power. In a high-leg delta system, one-phase winding of the transformer is center tapped to create a neutral connection. The other two-phase windings are connected in a delta configuration. The voltage between any two of the three phases is typically 240 volts, while the voltage between the high leg, also known as the wild leg or stinger leg, and the neutral is usually higher, typically 208 volts. The high leg in the system carries a higher voltage compared to the other two legs, and it is important to be aware of this voltage difference when connecting loads in the system. This voltage difference is why the high leg delta system is often used in applications where 208 volts are required, such as lighting and small motors while the lower voltage is used for other equipment and appliances. Corner grounded delta is one of the earliest forms of grounded systems in electrical installations. The corner grounded system offers a low-cost method of grounding a delta configuration. Generally, the grounding could be on any of the three phases from the transformer secondary, but the choice is usually the second or B phase for easy tracking. A corner grounded delta system offers the following benefits. Reduces the generation of transient overvoltage that occurs in systems without grounding. Establishes a ground reference for each current carrying conductor. Offers a low cost option to introduce a neutral line that will be grounded. To continue with the code, section 250.4A1 states that electrical system grounding 
electrical systems that are grounded shall be connected to earth in a manner that will limit the voltage imposed by lightning, line surges, or unintentional contact with higher voltage lines and that will stabilize the voltage to earth during normal operation. Although potentially very destructive, the effect of a lightning strike can be reduced by proper grounding. Keep in mind that a direct hit from lightning will cause damage to electrical appliances and possible wiring. Line surges happen when there's an interruption in the flow of electricity followed by a short, when an increased delivery of power is interrupted when electricity is sent flowing back into the system, or when a sudden increase of voltage is sent through a power system from internal or external forces. Power surges can range from as little as 1 volt over the threshold maximum of 169 volts to thousands of excess volts, such as when lightning strikes power lines or a transformer. Unintentional contact with a higher voltage line can cause a dangerous condition in an electrical system. Most commonly caused by a tree limb touching a power line or a small animal getting into a transformer. This is a possibility in an overhead distribution area where the primary conductors, those over 600 volts, may come into contact with the service conductors feeding the house. Complying with the prescriptive methods of grounding will surely help to limit the voltage. Informational note number one calls attention to the fact that an important aspect of limiting the voltage to ground includes keeping grounding electrode conductors as short as possible consistent with making the required connection, and, in particular, avoiding loops and bends as much as possible. What is the significance of minimizing the length of grounding electrode conductors and avoiding unnecessary loops or bends? The earth grounding conductor aims to establish a path with low impedance between the non-current carrying metal components of equipment and the earth. The term, low impedance, encompasses both resistance, which remains constant regardless of signal frequency, and reactance, which varies with frequency. The significance of this can be best exemplified through the following scenario. Imagine a properly sized earth grounding wire that contains numerous loops and sharp bends. While the resistance of the wire itself remains constant regardless of bends, it is important to consider that a wire is more than just a resistive component. Introducing multiple bends and loops can give the wire inductive properties. The inductance of the wire is directly proportional to frequency. While this grounding electrode conductor may be suitable for direct current, DC, or low frequency applications such as 50 or 60 Hz, it is crucial to recognize that during events like line surges, lightning strikes, and other related transients with frequencies over 100,000 Hz, the impedance of the path will significantly increase. Grounding of electrical equipment as per section 250.4A2 states that normally, non-current carrying conductive materials enclosing electrical conductors or equipment, or forming part of such equipment, shall be connected to the earth to limit the voltage to ground on these materials. Normally non-current carrying conductive materials refer to materials that are conductive but are not intended to carry current in the normal operation of the electrical system. These are metal conduits, metal sheathed cables, junction boxes and pull boxes, panel board enclosures, switchboard cabinets, cable gutter, etc. Their primary purpose is to provide protection and containment for the insulated conductors, overcurrent protective device, and other electrical accessories. The illustration shows that normally non-current carrying conductive materials are connected to the earth. If the installation of grounding complies with the prescriptive methods of this article, the grounding system will limit the voltage. When a fault or surge occurs in an electrical system, the grounding system redirects the excessive current to the ground preventing it from causing damage or posing a risk to people and equipment. The term limit is used because grounding system will not eliminate the voltage to ground on the materials. The fundamental principle of electricity is well known. Current always seeks a path back to its source. Current will naturally flow through all available paths or circuits. When multiple paths are present, the current will divide among them, with the division occurring inversely proportional to the impedance of each path. Consequently, Pads or circuits with lower impedance will carry a greater amount of current compared to those with higher impedance. That is why it is crucial to maintain a low grounding impedance because we cannot guarantee that the fault current will only flow to the equipment grounding conductor. The current will flow anywhere they can get a chance to. It is a common misconception that current takes the path of least resistance, and grounding will prevent someone from experiencing the electrical hazard of shock. In reality, to prevent electrical shocks, we need to focus on reducing touch potential or step potential by ensuring that all elements are at the same or equal potential. Why don't birds get electrocuted on power lines? If a bird had one foot on the wire it's perched on and the other foot on the ground or a wire with lower voltage, it would be electrocuted. 
This is because the bird would act as a conductor for the electric current to flow from the high voltage wire to the low voltage substance, ground. When a bird sits on a wire, one, the incomplete circuit hinders the flow of electrons needed for electricity conduction. Two, the potential difference across all points on the wire is zero. Similarly, if a person were to stand on top of a power line, he would also remain unaffected by the wire. A person standing on the ground, however, completes the circuit, so the person is electrocuted when coming into contact with the wire. A term limit is used because the grounding will help to limit the touch potential or step potential, not eliminate the touch and step potential. In the scenario being described, with a 120 volts, 10 amperes power source, the current will follow the path of least resistance through the equipment grounding conductor. This can result in personnel being exposed to a potential of 3.19 volts on the conductive surface of the equipment's case. At this voltage level, the current that may flow through a person can range from 0.03 mA to 10.6 mA. The person may be able to feel the current sufficiently to react and release their touch when it reaches 10.6 mA. Broken or loose connection grounding connection to metal enclosure the person exposed to a 116.81 volts potential can be harmless or lethal. Section 250.4A3 Bonding of electrical equipment Normally non-current carrying conductive materials enclosing electrical conductors or equipment, or forming part of such equipment, shall be connected to the electrical supply source in a manner that establishes an effective ground fault current path. Electrical bonding involves the act of connecting metallic objects that may come into contact with electrical faults or induced voltages to grounding conductors. In the given scenario, the panel board enclosures are bonded to the metallic conduit, forming a connection. Additionally, these panel board enclosures are linked to the ground terminal, establishing an effective ground fault path. This arrangement ensures that in the event of a fault, any excessive current can flow safely through the bonding and grounding conductors, minimizing the risk of electrical hazards and providing a reliable path for the fault current to be safely dissipated. Bonding non-current carrying conductive parts together also keep the conductive materials at the same electrical potential. This has the effect of eliminating any shock hazards between these bonded enclosures or parts. Section 250.4A4 Bonding of Electrically Conductive Materials and Other Equipment Normally non-current carrying electrically conductive materials that are likely to become energized shall be connected together into the electrical supply source in a manner that establishes an effective ground fault current path. Typically, electrically conductive materials and other equipment likely to become energized refers to metal water piping, metal gas piping and exposed structural steel members. In section 250.104 specify the rules of bonding the building's exposed structural metal, water piping, and other metal piping systems. Illustration shows a metal water piping systems installed in or attached to a building or structure is bonded to a service equipment enclosure as per section 250.104A1. For the sizes of bonding jumpers shall be as per table 250.102C1. Section 250.4A5 Effective Ground Fault Current Path Electrical equipment and wiring and other electrically conductive material likely to become energized shall be installed in a manner that creates a low impedance circuit, facilitating the operation of the overcurrent device or ground detector for high impedance grounded systems. It shall be capable of safely carrying the maximum ground fault current likely to be imposed on it from any point on the wiring system where a ground fault may occur to the electrical supply source. The earth shall not be considered as an effective ground fault current path. In order to achieve an effective ground fault path, certain performance requirements must be fulfilled. These requirements encompass the following, reliable, low impedance grounding circuit, correct conductor size. By meeting these requirements, the ground fault path can effectively enable the operation of overcurrent devices to clear fault currents. However, it is crucial to note that the earth itself is not an effective ground fault current path. Reliability and continuity of the grounding and bonding system play a vital role in ensuring the overall safety of the electrical system. This system not only establishes a stable voltage reference but also provides an effective pathway for fault currents during abnormal conditions. It is crucial to avoid intermittent connections, which can be likened to unpredictable earthquakes, capable of causing severe disruptions without warning. The grounding and bonding system, encompassing various elements such as wires, conduits, equipment enclosures, and other components along the path, must maintain electrical continuity. 
Furthermore, all connections within the system must be tightly secured and executed in a professional manner. A low impedance circuit is characterized by minimal impedance, which is achieved through proper installation techniques. Excessive impedance in the circuit can cause unnecessary delays in the operation of overcurrent protective devices, compromising the safety of the electrical system. To effectively limit the voltage to ground, it is essential to keep grounding electrode conductors as short as possible. This involves avoiding unnecessary loops and bends in the conductors, which can introduce additional impedance and impact the performance of the grounding system. By minimizing the length and complexity of the grounding electrode conductors, the voltage to ground can be effectively controlled, enhancing the overall safety and reliability of the electrical installation. Using properly sized conductors is crucial to safely handle the maximum expected fault current. This ensures that the conductors can carry the fault current without overloading or creating potential hazards. The minimum sizes for grounded conductors, bonding conductors, and equipment grounding conductors can be found in multiple locations, including Article 250. The sizes of equipment grounding conductors provided in Table 250.122 should be considered as the minimum requirements. By using conductors that meet or exceed these minimum sizes, the safety and effectiveness of the grounding and bonding system can be ensured, providing reliable protection against electrical faults and promoting overall electrical system safety. The Earth does not provide an effective pathway for ground fault current due to its limited conductivity. Insufficient fault current can flow back to the system winding through the Earth, which is necessary for triggering the operation of the overcurrent protective device. Consequently, the utilization of a rod or concrete encased electrode does not contribute to the clearance of ground faults. It is important to note that Earth connections are not designed for the purpose of carrying neutral or fault current. Their primary function is to dissipate over voltages caused by lightning or accidents resulting from contact between higher voltage lines of the electric utility system and lower voltage lines. Note that the primary objective of an effective ground fault current path is not always focused on facilitating the operation of overcurrent protective devices. In the case of high impedance grounded systems, for instance, the objective is to ensure the proper functioning of the required ground detector. This ground detector serves to activate alarms or other signals, indicating the presence of a ground fault condition. High impedance grounded systems do not rely on overcurrent protective devices like circuit breakers and fuses to protect against ground faults. Instead, these systems often allow ground faults to persist until they can be repaired in an organized and planned manner. To address this, the installation of a ground fault detection system becomes necessary, as overcurrent is not sufficient to interrupt the ground fault current. Well-designed detection systems can swiftly identify the specific branch feeder, switchgear, or load where the fault is occurring, enabling prompt and accurate troubleshooting.